Hey, hey, this is Orlando Rodriguez, and you're listening to On Face Edge with my main man, Joe Taylor. There are some people that believe science is truth, but I believe science points to truth because our science is always evolving. You're always making new hypotheses, getting new data. So it's going to point you to the truth, but it's in, in, in and of itself, it can't be the truth. I kind of like being somebody's main man. That's kind of cool, especially coming from somebody very cool like uh, Orlando Rodriguez. Thank you, Orlando, for the introduction. Orlando shares his story of up and coming hip hop star to making a decision to following his faith and the dramatic message from God that sent him down that path. You can hear our conversation at onfaithsedge.com slash 85. That's onfaithsedge.com slash 85. Well, hello. Welcome to the 86th episode of On Faith Sedge. My name is Joe Taylor, recovering atheist and your servant in Jesus Christ. This is your place to hear conversations about God and living a life of faith in Jesus Christ. We are going to have a fantastic time together today. In today's show, we speak with scientist and author Randy Dawkins, Dr. Randy Dawkins. And in the Your Story segment, we have a very cool conversation with listener Clay Lamb. I am still accepting submissions for the Your Story segment. If you want to share your story of faith with your fellow On Faith Sedge listeners, just go to onfaithsedge.com slash your story. I would love, love, love to hear from you. I also love bringing you engaging conversations about faith. If this show entertains you, encourages you, informs you, or brings value to you in any way whatsoever, would you consider financially backing the show? The best way to do that right now is is to use an Amazon link at onfaithsedge.com. Any Amazon link at onfaithsedge.com. We'll get a modest commission from the purchase, and it doesn't cost you a penny more. Well, congratulations to listeners Betty Rosamwaldi, Michael Coldiron, and Nico Sabakos from Australia. Nico Sabakos. Nico, if I pronounced either one of your names wrong, man, I'm really, really sorry. All the way from Australia, Nico uh, Sabakos. T-S-O-B-A-K-O-S. Somebody out there, correct me if I'm if I'm wrong. Nico, again, I apologize if I butchered your name. Congratulations to Betty Rosa Maldi, Michael Coldiron, and Nico. All will receive Orlando Rodriguez CD, Turn the World Off. And if you're listening to this, shoot me an email at joe at onfaithsedge.com, and I'll get your CD right out to you. Again, that's joe at onfaithsedge.com, and I'll get the CD right out to you. Congrats. Great, great CD. Now let's hear our chat with listener Clay Lamb. Clay Lamb, welcome to the show. Well, thank you, Joe. Thanks for uh, answering the call as a uh, as a listener to On Faith's Edge and answering the your story call. I really, really appreciate it. How long have you uh, How long have you been a listener to the show? Well, Joe, I guess it's been about almost two years now because I played a little bit of a background on who you are, and I thought it was pretty interesting. I just like what you're doing as far as You've got a different message and a different approach to things, Joe. Well, I appreciate that. I appreciate that. Do you have a uh, Do you have a particular episode that stands out to you? A particular guest that uh, really touched you? You've had a lot of people on that speak from their heart. I'm trying to think of the couple that was just recently on about two weeks ago, Joe. Um, Reg, uh, Reginald and uh, Renee Morris. Yeah. The, okay. Yeah. yeah. What a testimony! What a powerful testament. Thank you for coming me there. They couldn't think of their name. The, the, you know, I sat back and I just couldn't shut that off. My wife said, what are you listening to? I said, probably one of the most interesting testimonies I've ever heard. That's one of those stories that you, you, you think when you're listening to the story, and even when I was interviewing them, uh, uh, that's one of those stories that you think they're saying, they're telling this story out loud. <laughs> they're, they're being very transparent and very revealing. Uh, Renee had an affair and was living with another man and, and uh, she uh, and he did not give up on his marriage. You know what I liked about that about that particular episode, Clay? Well, let well, me guess. She went over and knocked on her door. That's what I thought was powerful. <laughs> I know, I know. the The thing that stood out in my mind was when he thought to himself, "Well, my marriage is over because you, it takes two to 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 make a marriage." And he and right. he got a word from God that said, uh, "No, I'm a part of this marriage." Two thirds of this marriage are still committed, me and you, and uh, with we'll we'll bring this marriage back together. That's what he felt God was saying in his heart. So the majority of the people involved in that marriage, God, Reginald, and Renee, uh, 
Reginald and Renee were still, uh, I mean, Reginald and God were still engaged in the marriage. So, uh, the majority was there. That was a, yeah, that, I really liked that interview. I really liked that. Well, interview. There's another thing there, Joe, that's really interesting to me is that too often we might hear God. We deny that it's God actually speaking to us because it puts in this audible voice, but it was your heart twitch. Something went there. We said, oh, that was just me. Which he clicked right away. It was God speaking to him. And I think a lot of us miss that. We do. We do. I think that we, we ignore that, uh, uh, that small voice in our head. And then, and as mm-hmm. believers, we have the Holy spirit, uh, and we need to trust that. Okay. We, uh, the Holy spirit has filled that space now and we need to trust right. those, trust those promptings. I think that we, we also need to be careful and, and test, test those promptings against, doctrine and against uh wise counsel uh but also i think that we need to trust those those prompts more do you agree with that i'm always scared when somebody when god told me i said i want to hear the credential behind it i want to find out what it is what's the status on the scripture i want to know where it's coming from good good point good good point man well thank you for listening to the show clay it means a lot to me uh, I certainly, uh, I certainly appreciate all of our listeners, and of course, it means a lot that you've uh, you've answered the call to tell your story. Obviously, from the, this the first part of this conversation, you are a Christian. I am. How did That's you? Nineteen seventy four. Nineteen seventy four. So, yeah. Um, you became a Christian as a as an adult then. Yeah, my wife and I married one year, and she drugged me to a Captain Coleman miracle service. I thought she was totally nuts, and. Uh, my heart was changed in an instant when I saw a little boy, uh, three rows down and three rows over. He looked at his mom and said, I can hear. I can hear. And it's like, Joe, I was the only one in the whole auditorium that knew what was going on. It was so real. Wow. It changed my life. Boom. Just like that. Wow. You know, I'll be, I'll be honest and authentic with you here, Clay. I struggle with healing services and those types of situations myself because there are so many charlatans. Uh, involved oh, gosh, in, yeah. in that world that uh, sometimes we can't uh, we can't decipher who who is really from God and who is just out trying to uh, bamboozle people but you felt that uh, this was truly a a God moment well Joe to me it's like that that one scripture credential I look at once I was blind but now I can see and it was that quick that instantaneously I knew what happened in my life so did you did you grow up in a Christian home? Did you have a Christian background? Um, I want to say yes. No, we had figuratively we'd gone to we'd gone to church. Uh, a lot of craziness, you know, partying and stupid stuff in church uh, affiliation. My mom did with uh, with groups, and I didn't like that. I thought it was very phony. It wasn't until my wife had met a friend of theirs and said, "You want to get serious about God?" We started going to a Catholic charismatic group, and I thought this is crazy. And I'm not even Catholic. I saw the realness of some of the things going on there, and we uh, got baptized in the Holy Spirit, received Jesus, and moved forward, and it just been, it's not an easy walk, it's a serious walk, but you can, always can rely on the Lord. Well, even in today's problems, you know, you can just reach back and say, thank you, Lord, for being there, and just kind of recognize His hands are around you and everything you do. So obviously, yeah. obviously you, you answered the call to tell your story because you felt like that you have a story to tell. Uh, so let's take you from 1974 and, and talk about your faith walk with Christ. H- have you ever had a time where, where you didn't believe in God or, or you felt that God was aband- had been abandoned you or you said, you know what, this whole, this whole faith in God thing is, is a bunch of bunk and, and I just don't, I don't think God's there anymore. Have you ever had a time in, in, in your life like that? Joe, I'm very fortunate. I've never had a doubt of God. I've never shook my fist at anger, and I've had crazy things in my life like everybody else. I'm very fortunate. I've never had that that emotion. Mine is like, what did I do wrong? What do I got to fix here? And mine is like, put me in check, Lord. And I call upon it. Put me in check. I want to get fixed. I've never really shook my hand at him. Like, why are you doing this, God? And I've gone through some problems just like everybody else. So let's talk about let's talk about your, your faith walk then. Uh, sure. How have um, how has God been evident in your life? Obviously, He has because uh, you've never experienced that moment where you thought God had abandoned you or didn't even exist. So, obviously, God has been evident in your life. Uh, tell me about how God has been evident in your life. 
Well, let's put it this way. The first time, I guess, the really important thing was my wife and I wanted a child. And for almost four years, we really sought the Lord. And uh, one day, this is after four years and really struggling with this issue. We said, let's pray and fast together on just bread and water for three days. And Joe, almost nine months to the week, we had our first child. And it was real. Wow. Wow. So how many kids do you have now? Three. All Seven grandkids, and everybody lives within close proximity of about five, ten minutes away. No kidding. No kidding. I know a lot of grandma and grandpas are out there going, oh, I wish mine were like that. <laughs> um, we're very fortunate. <laughs> We call Mary Jo, my wife, Grandpa Hoover. She's driving them all over the city. <laughs> what kind of what kind of work do you do? What kind of business are you in, Clay? I run a, ch- a chimney and masonry company. Okay, and been doing it for about thirty five years. Okay, multi truck operation. I've been on the mountain. I've been on the valley, and uh, each day it's a new struggle, a new climb, and uh, keep reaching out for his hand to pull me up, keep growing me. In 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 business, and I and I like to ask business people this particularly. Uh, in business, have you ever had a time where uh, you thought it was in the best interest of the business to maybe set aside your 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 principles of faith uh, for the sake of for the sake of profit, for the sake of expediency, for the sake of well, it would just be easier if I just looked the other way. Joe, sure, naked, I came in naked. I'm going out. I can't take, <laughs> I can't take a look. I don't care. I'm, I'm very fortunate. I'm not. Uh, that's not stuck in money. And right. I do, and money's a, a competitive thing. We all need it. But if it's what defines you, you got a problem. And I'm very fortunate I'm not. You know, I can remember one time I threw 10 or 20 bucks out the window. My kids were arguing about money and stuff. I just rolled it out the window and threw it out the window. <laughs> wow. Wow. That's it's funny. It's only money. It's a tool. So how has, how has God made himself evident in your life, Clay? Well, Joe, I had a really awkward situation about uh, 2003. We had a serviceman killed on one of our job sites. And it it really um, it didn't define me, but it, it was a benchmark. It was a landmark in our life. As far as a couple, Mary Jo and I had to really reach into each other, hold each other to this crazy mess because there was lawsuits. There was OSHA fines. There was problems with some of the employees. Um, and even though we were finally totally dismissed of everything. There was actually a, a lawsuit filed against me for a wrongful death of an employer who's electrocuted. Mm. And it was devastating. We lost everything. We lost a home we just built. We lost almost every piece of retirement we had in defense of what we were trying to defend our innocence from. And uh, it just part of the game. And we had to really restart. We had to reinstitute everything all over again. And uh, that's a little different when you're, I mean, I'm 67 today, and this is in 2003, so we're talking about 12, 13 years ago, and it's tough when you're that age, 50-some years old, and trying to say, okay, i got to regroup here. What am I going to do? And I didn't want to go out and work another job, and I had offers all over the country. But I thought, no, i got employees here that have families, and uh, if I had to do it again, I don't know if I'd do it the same way, Joe, but I did it. Let's put it that way. So this was back in 2003. Is that yeah. right? How, yeah. how, how did how did you how did God bring you through that? Well, first off, uh, I I got real serious. You know, you get real serious when you have attorneys and police officers, and you're sitting there talking in the, to the the uh, young man who's thirty seven, and he he was killed electric electrocuted, and I was in a room with him, and uh, that time I was in a room with his mother, and she was just ripping on me and I understood I feel sorry for him. You know, I've lost a lot of things, but she lost her son. And it was heartbreak. And uh reaching out to God said, Lord, give me direction. What do I say? What do I do? And uh I could hear his heart and it's like be still and he did take care of it. You no, know, I've never reconciled with the whole family. I think they'd passed on since that time, the mother and father. But I had to make some tough decisions in my own life where I was gonna go and who, and who my source was, and it was the relationship with God. I have to make decisions. I'm going to stand on what God wants, and He did. He's regrown our business, an opportunity to expand. He's in a larger tent. Let's put it that way. <laughs> How was your? Did you when, when you look back, uh, what what kind of changes did you have to make in your life, and maybe even in your business, Clay, uh, as a result of this tragedy? 
Well, let's do it. physically, I had I stayed in the same location, but I had to resolve dissolve the whole corporation. There's too much liability. My corp, my uh, I guess my liability insurance went about fifty thousand dollars. My workers' comp went out of control, so I had to start another corporation and uh, have job experience with that. And uh, this leadership within my company, I think I was called to be a stronger leader, of uh, given a vision because. When something like that happens, you can meander through what you're doing day by day, or you can make, make a choice, I'm going to lead this ship. And uh, that's what I had to do. I just suck it up and make sure I was being accountable to really build the business and not deploy me. You know, Joe, one time, I got to the point, like I said, I'm really tired of telling a story. I'm tired of hearing it myself. And I had to back up on some things and really get real serious about focusing on helping my employees, helping my customers. Mm. How do you today? How do you how do you engage your faith? Well, I'm not one of these guys where I'm Bible thumping, but by the grace of God, I hope I never deny Him any portion of my life, and not shy when you know when I get mad and I bloat in front of my guys. I'm not shy about saying I ask for your forgiveness. Forgiveness. I always say if you cuss, and I have, and I always say it's the inability to communicate intelligently. And I always say that to my guys. So I'm wrong. I ask for your forgiveness. So if I screw up, I want to ask that forgiveness. My wife says, I think it's a lot of times because you've been in prison programs too long. <laughs> so, but it's no excuse. No excuse to be angry or curse. You know, we're called to be God's witness to the world. And I think the bigger witness is when you screw up, you fix it up. So you mentioned something that I, I want to I want to dig deep a, a little deeper into. Uh, sure. Prison ministry. You've uh, you've worked in prison ministry. I have. I did it for uh, about thirty some years. And uh, a unique story. I was at a bio meeting one night, and I met a guy, and uh, we were talking. And I said, "I'd like to get the prison program." And he said, "I can help you out." I was going to meet him next Tuesday, and uh, I'll just leave his first name is Bob. And Bob and I were supposed to get together. Bob picked up a guy thumbing that week, and uh, the guy pulled out a gun and shot him. What he did, he picked Bob up. Bob was driven to a wooded area. And the judge told me, actually, that he fired a gun shot in his chest. And as he's, 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 he's Bob slid down the tree, he said, I forgive you, and I asked God to forgive you. And the, the assailant shot him two more times. This came out in testimony in oh the courtroom. It, it's pretty powerful. And at that time, I kind of picked up the baton decided I was going to pick up a prison program. I did it for 30 years in the county and the state prisons. And then I had an opportunity to uh, travel to the Middle East a couple of times. And I started a very serious teaching program, just uh, geography and geology of ancient history. And I really am fascinated by it. And when that came about, that was fine. But then just in this last year and a half, I've just picked up, I'm back into the prison ministry and back into the penitentiaries. I like working with hardcore people and I, you got a minute, I'll tell you something really interesting if you would like to. Sure. Um, I always teach forgiveness. The forgiveness of three murders in the Bible. Most people say, three murders in the Bible. And I said, yep. You have to think about it. You think Moses killed a man and buried him, and he fled in Midian. And then David lusted after a beautiful woman, and it was one of his main guards, one of his main warriors. And he had a relationship with her, got her pregnant, and he sent him to the front line and premeditated his murder. And then we have an accessory with Paul stoning Stephen, just holding the cloaks. It's still an accessory in today's court system. So I have three murders I talk about that God used mightily after they've been involved with a murder. And God used them and God forgave them. And he can use you too. And I always say this in prisons. And you can be amazed at how many people turn their eyes and like, wow, I can really be forgiven. Yeah. God, the majority of the Bible is written by three major characters. So you can use them. You can use us. So when you're, when you're face to face with these hardcore, um, prisoners, murderers, as you said, murderers yeah. and thieves and probably yeah. rapists. And these are hardcore yeah. criminals. Um, yeah. I mean, you're not, you're not speaking to the, to the guy that's three days in a weekend. Cause he can't pay a, pay a speeding ticket these are <laughs> <laughs> these are hardcore criminals when you're face to face with these hardcore criminals clay uh what is their reaction to your message 
what is their reaction and and what are you what are you feeling inside Joe I've always been received in love because I'm really point blank because I've had f bombs dropped in church service meetings with me and it doesn't freak me out I don't judge them I just love them and I said you know just talk about forgiveness you know it's about forgiveness in it you know I screwed up enough in my life and I'm sure most of our the people that are listening to our conversation right now screwed up too and we're, we've got to wipe the piety out of our life and recognize that God uses our nothingness to reach into somebody else's life. And that's where it is. And I just recognize that I've been very fortunate, Joe, because I can work at a prison, prison program, excuse me, prison program, but I really have a hard time in nursing homes. <laughs> I'm sorry, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> are, are you scared, Clay, when you do prison no, ministry? Not at all. Not at all. It, you know, that's the God gift, I think, Joe. You know, the way I came about it with the, uh, a murder of a, a newly acquainted person, that's one thing. I got involved in the penitentiary system right away. And there's a lot of pain there, a lot of pain. And just trying to help people get through some of that. You know, I'm not this great evangelist. You know, I have a battery of, you know, maybe 25, 30 scriptures I repeat over and over, but it's about a forgiveness message all the time. And, and how has, how has that forgiveness, forgiveness message been received? Always well received. And another thing I do, Joe, I've always taught a lot because I dealt with a lot of teenagers are bound up with grand juries and tried at 15, 14, 15, 16, and 17 before they go to the adult side. But these were up on the high floors. In other words, they were going to be charged with multiple rape, multiple murder, arson, things like that. So they were going to catch penitentiary time. But I had a chance to reach into the heart because most of them didn't have a father. I always thought it's easy to be a father. It's hard to be a daddy. Mm. And they understood what I was saying. And I said, you got short changed. So what are you going to do about it, guys? What are you going to do about it? Do you have any relationships uh, with these guys? Uh, if any of them are, are out, do you have, any, have you maintained any relationships with these guys once you know, they're honestly, released? Joe, you know, I'm, I make it a point not to do that. And there's a couple of reasons I do it. Number one, I've never wanted to ministry to be inside my house to my wife and kids when they were growing up. And number two, I don't want to be a crutch. I always give them directions. Now, in the church system I'm right now, I'm involved through a church system, which brings them in like that. But for the longest time, my, I knew they were going to catch time. And I was dealing with so many guys, I could not end up writing 50, 60, 70 guys. I knew I couldn't do it. You never promise something. You can't deliver. Mm. Mm. You also, but if I could, I want to make sure I tell you, if I can get them to understand the Bible, I've always start out with the Bible, the, the index, table of contents, the most important page. Is that way you know what's going on, where you're at. I divide the book and the Bible in two sections: Old Testament, New Testament, and I would talk about that and just give them some basic understanding of that black book that's almost untouchable. I want them to understand what it is. And then I got him into Proverbs, Joe. The book of Proverbs taught them wisdom. And I'd make, maybe I'd be sitting with 10, 15 guys. I'd say, okay, what's it mean to you? And it's going to mean something different to each one of us. In that proverb, whatever the day of today, like today's the 23rd, let's go into chapter 23 and read it. And next week, whatever day, I want you to go to that chapter and just read it monthly, monthly, monthly. And it will reveal itself differently almost every time you read it is it's about that internal check that god puts in your heart isn't the bible amazing that way i mean yeah. only only a book only a book written by god uh only a book written by god for his children can be um eternally contemporary meaning uh, meaning this this when you you could read this book a hundred years ago and it had, yeah. and you felt like it's speaking to a situation right then you could read it a thousand years ago and you and it, right. and it feels like it's speaking to a situation right then. And you'll be able to read that book a hundred years from now, uh, assuming we're here a uh, hundred years from now. I hope not. <laughs> uh, uh, and that, uh, and that book, that book yeah. will be contemporary for, the moment. And that's one of the things that, that, that brought me to, uh, brought me to 
Christianity. And you know, this as a listener, Clay, I'm a, I call myself a recovering atheist and I love that. <laughs> yeah. And, uh, I call myself a recovering atheist and I, I came to God in a very logical process. And part of that process was when I realized that, that there is no great thinker, no, uh, great philosopher. And we know that Jesus was more than that, but let's, let's leave it at that for now. There was no right. great thinker or great philosopher in history that addressed the human condition and spoke to the human condition better than Jesus Christ. And that's the condition of the, the need for uh, acceptance and the need for grace. And, uh, and those two things nail n- nailed it for me <laughs> on, on Christian, on Christianity. So yeah, yeah it's amazing. The, the Bible's a, a, an amazing book. If you let it, if you let it speak to you, you mentioned it before, I don't want to lose this clay. You mentioned sure. it before that you, uh, you do some travel. Uh, d- did you say to the middle East or? Yes. Okay. Yes, uh, as I've gotten older, I've been fortunate. I can take some my, uh, money set aside, and I really enjoyed traveling to the Middle East. I actually had an employee one time that's studying, he's finishing a, a college doctor's degree, and he's worked with me, and he ended up being the president of Jerusalem University, and I've actually gone there and studied a semester abroad, which was a fascinating opportunity. I felt here I am, the chimney sweep with uh, about 25 of those brilliant kids that can speak multiple languages and interpret things, and I was the chimney sweep, and they exposed me some really interesting insights for the Bible. And then I went to another trip just about uh, two years ago. I had another opportunity with uh, Land in the Book, which is another great podcast. I don't know if you're listening. listening. That's one of my favorites. And uh, I, I really like to understand more about the Middle East and their travel back and forth. It's the land, which is Israel, and the book, the Bible. Fascinating. I've and never... I want to... Go ahead. I've never been there myself, but everybody that I've talked to that has gone to uh, that area, especially Jerusalem, uh, even even people who are not believers who have been there say that there is something special about this place. There is something uh, – I, 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 I don't think the word holy was used because I don't think these guys would have used the word holy. Uh, but they, they certainly indicated that there's, there's a special, there's a, there's something special about this place. I think it's the realness, Joe. I think it's the reality of all the stuff we've read. You come to a passage and you might see something about the Jordan River or, uh, Masada, which met Sudal, which is a mountaintop where David was on top of, or anything of Jerusalem going to Jericho. And you go into these places and think, wow. Now, you have to put on your archaeology glasses mentally, and you think, okay, what am I looking at? But when you look at the scriptures, you sit down with somebody that's really teaching you about that. And all the um, actual tour guides in Israel are licensed, and they know their stuff. It's not just somebody giving you a tour through New York. These guys and gals know their stuff, which is very impressive. You know, and I don't want to miss this, but you said something about the Bible reading. I listened to a guest that you had on your show all the time this thing. Brian Harden, a daily audio Bible. Yeah, Brian. Brian's been on the show. Yeah. Oh my gosh. That if if your listeners want something to eat and feed on every day, that's a powerful another podcast that I listen to every morning. I start my day listening to daily uh, to daily audio Bible because I want to put the word of God in me. So I'm convicted when I screw up. I want to be convicted. I want the heart check. So Brian's Brian's uh, daily audio Bible is fantastic, and uh, he's got a he's got a really cool movie about the Holy Land where he he takes some striking footage, uh, and yeah. I can't think of the name of it right now, but uh, I'll, I'll make sure I put it in today's show notes. I'll put a link to daily audio Bible and a link to that uh, uh, to that interview and a link to that uh, to that movie that he's done because it is it's really really cool. I agree with you, Clay. Uh, Daily Audio Bible is a tremendous resource, a tremendous, tremendous resource. Yeah, he speaks so much from his heart. When he reads, I mean, there's nobody that reads like it, not even close to it. You know, it's not that Elizabethan sound, it's just so real. But he really goes deep into your heart, and I really want that heart check when I wake up. Yeah, he's got a, he's got a uh, real uh, a real gift for that. God has really given a gift sure for reading, reading the Word out loud. And not everybody can do it. Uh, but boy, Brian is 
Brian really has a good uh, uh, heart for for that tremendous, tremendous show. I'm glad you brought that up because I, I frankly haven't listened to it in a long time, but it's uh, it's fantastic. So what you do you know? What's really interesting, Joe? I think he was a rebel as a kid, a, a preacher's kid, and look what he does. He probably preaches to more people daily than anybody in the world. <laughs> Maybe he, he's probably out there with Billy Graham as far as touches of people. <laughs> this may be this may not be accurate, but I, I think that that show has tens of millions of of listens. I mean, it's it sure the downloads are outrageous. Yeah, I mean, you cannot believe it. And remember, that's interpreted in many new languages now. Fantastic! What a tremendous ministry, really is. Yeah. So, what does uh, what do you think God has in store for Clay Lamb going forward? Um, you know, it's funny because I'm six or seven. You think you're going to wind down, but I think I'm just starting to wind up. I feel there's other things that God wants me to do. I just got to be open about it. Have to have my hands wide open to receive it, and be ready to challenge and move forward. And I'm sure He's going to make me uncomfortable, which is okay. And I want to be uncomfortable. I don't want to get complacent. You know, I look at when you're first new Christian, you're excited. You could you could move a mountain with your faith. Then you go cold sometimes. Not cold in the sense, or maybe hardened. I don't know. Callous is probably a better word. And I don't want to be callous. I want to be a fresh source of use. I want to be touching so other people. Now he may not do it the same way that he did it before through me, but you darn well know if he's using just like he is using you, Joe. You're reaching to people's hearts this a podcast there's no doubt about it well clay thank you so much for being a listener to the show thanks for sharing your story uh with us and uh if there's any thing that uh any way that we can serve you please don't hesitate to to reach out to the show uh one one final thing and and i don't know if you're comfortable with this or not clay but is there anything that uh as a as a family as an on faith's edge family that uh, we can pray for you for Oh, always with our families, our family, my, my, my son, my daughters, and their family, a protection and over us. I, uh, my business is important to me. Those are the kind of things. So, you know, I always want somebody to pray for my family. We have good, you know, my, I have seven grandkids. And I look at them in another world that are there today. It's so unlike what I grew up in. And I want protection. I want hedges of protection, not to isolate them, but make them warriors for Christ to stand strong with their faith, what they're doing. Well, we'll be sure to, we'll be sure to pray for you, Clay. Thanks for being a listener. Thanks for coming on the show to tell your story. If you want to tell your story to the On Faith's Edge community, uh, just go to onfaithsedge.com slash your story. And I would love to chat with you. Clay, thank you so much for hanging out. My pleasure, my friend. God bless, brother. Today's featured guest is Dr. Randy Dawkins. Dr. Randy Dawkins has a fascination with science and the Bible. He began his scientific career as a pharmacokinetic reviewer for the FDA and later joined a leading pharmaceutical company as a lead scientist, analyzing how the body affects drugs after administered. He has worked on medicines for hepatitis, Alzheimer's, and other neurological disorders. Today, he is a senior researcher working around the world to discover and develop new drugs. In other words, he's a really, really, really smart guy. For the last 10 years, uh, he has turned his attention to academic Bible study. He has a master's degree in Jewish studies and a doctorate in biblical prophecy. Dr. Dawkins has chosen the fiction genre to express his stand that science and faith are not contradictory, but make sense together. The first book of his trilogy THB, book one of the Coded Message Trilogy, is in stores right now, September 2017. In today's show, we discuss why science and faith go hand in hand, why are contemporary scientists resistant to matters of faith, how does science support the evidence of a God, and his new science fiction book, THB, from the Coded Message Trilogy. Today, we're going to tackle a topic that some Christians are uncomfortable with, the tension between science and faith. And you guys know my story. I came to faith in a very logical process, a reasonable process. Some of my early influences were people like William Lane Craig and Ravi Zacharias. Uh, I've asked uh, Dr. Randy Dawkins to come on the show. Now, Dr. Dawkins have, has written a trilogy of books called the Coded Message Trilogy. Uh, he is a scientist. And, but he has written a group of uh, novels. 
uh, fiction. You are my first fiction writer uh, on the show. I feel honored. Thank you. (laughs) (laughs) But we're going to talk a lot about facts and facts of faith and facts of science. All right. And then we're going to dig into uh, the first book of the Coded Message Trilogy, THB. Randy, how did your... um, how did your interest in science begin? Let's start there. Well, I suppose that uh, back to, to high school, I was very interested in biology, chemistry, physics. Um, and when I then went to college, I had to choose a major. And I can't tell you why I chose pharmacy, but I chose pharmacy and just sort of stuck with it uh, because it helped. It, that included, um, you know, uh, chemistry and, and other types of, of science um, courses that, uh, that, you know, that that interested me so that's how i i just chose it and stuck with it gotcha so So the your your background is in pharmaceuticals right is that right that's correct and you are a christian yes okay uh you would consider yourself a scientist yes correct right fair enough how do you explain the idea that the idea that you claim science and faith go hand in hand well, I, I think one of the main things is, you know, as, as, as scientists, we, we, we try to say that we're, we're unbiased and we try to be as unbiased as possible. But um, I've come to, to realize that everybody has a worldview uh, that you filter everything through, even when you try not to. You, you either, I think you either believe God exists in some form or fashion, or you believe that he doesn't exist. So everything that you see and think about comes through that filter. And I think when you are looking at data and trying to make a decision, you have to sort of realize that you have that filter in order to really make a, a valid conclusion. And I think that's sometimes how we get tripped up, that we're sort of, we're sort of biasing ourselves even when we don't realize that we are. And so when uh, one of the things that, that I, I discovered was like for a cell, which is very, very we find it's very complicated. Of course, when like the theory of evolution first started, we thought a cell was very simple. We find out it's very complicated. And what we find out is that you need a protein to make a protein. And so we sometimes sort of gloss over that uh, because when you get down, you know, sometimes we say the devil's in the details, but we also find that God is in the details. Mm. And we find that in a cell, you need this protein called a chaperonin, uh, which is a, a 3D conformed protein that you need that to make the other proteins conform into a 3D structure that can actually be viable. So then the question is, if the first one had to be made and formed and you need a protein to do that, how did that happen? So, that, so that's how I, I think you, you either have to sort of just assume it happens without really thinking about it, or if you really think about it, you have to then at least have the, the plausibility that something else other than just time would uh, make that happen. We know that many, many scientists throughout history, um, I think of uh, Isaac Newton, uh, were actually believers in Jesus Christ. Uh, why, why are contemporary scientists so resistant to matters of faith? Probably, as we all are, we are, we are afraid to change. We are, we, we are afraid that if we accept something that we don't understand, that we're going to have to change or, or it's, it's going to, we're going to lose our control. We won't be in control of ourselves anymore. Um, and I think, that's, I think that's the part that j- just because you're a scientist it d- doesn't take you out of the human realm of, of you know, having the, those uh, types of thoughts and even probably not being conscious of that, but we were sort of opposed to, opposed to change and thinking that we have to change, even though perhaps we don't. What you're saying is scientists who, are, who, who, who tout that they lo- only look at facts and they only look at the way things actually are uh, and they only look at um, provable evidence, uh, if that's maybe the right way to say it, when there is evidence that is contradictory to what they current believe, they're not nearly as open-minded to that change. Not maliciously, but right. not nearly as open-minded as, as what, what they would. Right. And, and, and as, as I say, I, I think 
because we have we have this worldview that that is just there, that uh, you have to that if you really look at all the evidence and put all the evidence together, you have to be willing to go outside of your worldview at times to consider the, uh, the, the other possibility. And some people are just not willing to do that. It's nearly impossible to go into the, all the complexities of this, this question. So right. my audience is very smart, so I'm going to ask you to dumb it down for me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, give us some examples of how science supports the idea of, of a god. It was sort of revolutionary to me. Um, w- when I was in school, an atom was composed of protons, neutrons, and electrons, and that was the basic b- building blocks of an atom. But we now we find that even protons and neutrons are made up of s- other particles that are called quarks. And, um, and what I, when I was reading about this, it, re- it sort of reminded me of the attributes of God himself. What are those called again? Quarks. Quartz. Q U A R K S. Okay. So uh, if you're if you're a Star Trek fan, it's not the Ferengi on Deep Space uh, Nine. <laughs> I am a Star Trek fan. <laughs> so this is a different kind of quark. <laughs> um, but uh, but th- those are we know that they're 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 uh, you have different types of, of of them. There's an up and down that's uh, c- c- components of, of protons and neutrons, but you can't really separate them. And to me, uh, that sort of re- reminds me of what Christ said about him and, and the Father. He said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father, I and my Father are one. In other words, you can't separate them, although they're really different. And I, I think that's how we have, that we, we know that God is pure love, but he's also pure justice. And so those, t- to me, are sort of, they're like, they, they would naturally repel each other. And we know that in the center of the atom, the protons are positive charged, and they repel each other, but they stay there. And so there's all this other component called a gluon that actually holds the quarks together, so it that overcomes the repelling force and makes it stable. And to me, that reminds me of the Holy Spirit, that he's able to hold God's justice and love together so they both can perform the way they're supposed to. And he says also that the Holy Spirit is what draws us to him and holds us to him. So to, to, to me, the Holy Spirit is like the, if you want to call it the cosmic gluon that holds it, holds it all, all together. So I think, you know, to, for, for me, and I, and I have a couple of blog posts where I talk about this, that to me, that to me, that's God's fingerprint. And that's where I would think God's fingerprint would be if he's the creator he creates all matter. So at the heart of all matter, we find God. And you find the biblical concept of God, all those things that you just said, in the smallest, from the sub, most sub, subatomic parts of our existence to the cosmos. We find the fingerprints of God. Right. Talking about, talking about the fingerprints of God, uh, we just recently had a guest on the show, the producer of Is Genesis History. What is your take on the idea? Uh, you know, I, I'm not going to come to, I, I don't come to that question with any bias one way or the other. I want your sincere, your sincere thoughts on this. What do you think about the idea of creation and evolution, old earth, young earth? Okay, well, um, I, I think as he proposed, and, and I, I think it's, it's, it's very true, the real difference between creationism and evolution is the concept of time. I think uh, as a creationist, the idea of something happening quickly is not too hard to grasp. Because if you believe in an all-powerful God, you know, he says it and it happens. So that's not too hard to believe. With, as an evolutionist, you need the element of time to make things happen because the probability is extremely small for the things that we're talking about happening. So you need a lot of time because uh, with, with probability for something to happen, you need the, the time in order to make it happen. Um, but then, to me, the flaw there is assuming that the same thing is happening all the time. But we, we know that even in our daily lives, that over short periods of time, it's not constant. Uh, 
it's really the calamities of the world that define what, what occurs. If you look at like Mount St. Helens, uh, Mount Vesuvius, it's all these cataclysmic events that make things happen where you, get, you can get petrified wood in a very short period of time, whereas if it occurred naturally, it would take you know, uh, you know, hundreds of years for it to happen. So we, we already see there's, there's ways that uh, things happen uh, through a cataclysmic event. And the other issue I, that I have w with it is that by the time you know, if you, by the time you have enough time for something to happen, all these other things have already occurred, which now perturbs that, and so, so you never get to that place because something else is already occurring. So, to me, that that's the the biggest problem and the biggest difference be between the two is that you have to assume that, that time is a constant and things occur as they normally occur every day. And so as a, uh, as a scientist, uh, you can firmly say that faith and science are not exclusive of each other, but science supports the existence of God. Yes, I I certainly b believe that. I know there are m many scientists that would re refute that, um, but to me, the more I understand about our world, about the macrocosm, the microcosm, it's so complex uh, that to me, I just don't see how anything could evolve on its own because there's too many things that have to happen. I can't put enough zeros behind the decimal. Uh, to make it make sense to me. Some warped concepts of science actually draw people away from faith. So these are very serious, these are very serious topics. But your book, the Coded Message Trilogy, the first book, THB, is a novel. Yes. Uh, a piece of fiction. Why did you decide to go in that direction? Well, I think a couple of reasons. Uh, one is, um, I think uh, a story uh, gets people's interest a lot faster, I think. And I, I know that, I know especially with, with my kids, um, if you want them to learn something, you have to entertain them to make them learn. Uh, and I thought, well, you know, uh, I want people to understand, have a better understanding of God. I, I'm not sure that 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 we do. I, I don't know that we give uh, God the credit that he, that he deserves. Um, and so I thought, well, let's have a story that would be hopefully a compelling, fun read. It's not, it's not real heavy and deep, but yet there's, uh, there's elements that would be th sort of thrown in where as the characters um, have to make decisions, hopefully the readers would be thinking about, well, is that a decision that I could make or should make um, or, or, or not? So uh, I, I'm hoping that people like the story, they get caught up in the story. Uh, the first book actually puts, uh, sets the stage, and the second and third book actually then goes into how they discover something about God because their world is at the moment totally devoid of all religion. So they have to uh, first of all discover that God is even a concept and then how do they then take that information and where do they go with that? So what genre would, uh, would this trilogy fall into in the fiction book it, world? It, it's, uh, it's sort of uh, science fiction uh, because it involves an astrophysicist who's working on a Mars mission. Uh, and he you know, finds this, these letters THB and has to decide what it is. So it starts out as a mystery with, with adventure. And then a love interest is thrown in, of course. Cool. Tell us about... Uh, the Coded Message trilogy, starting with the book THB. We, you said that it's in the in the scientific science fiction realm, but tell us the story. Okay, well, it's it's set uh, towards the the end of this century, around 2089. So, um, uh, an astrophysicist, um, actually, he's he uh, meet his his girlfriend at this coffee shop and he's waiting for her. This piece of confetti falls down. It has these three letters on it, THB. He doesn't know what it is. This person comes up to him and tries to, starts to take it. He starts to give it away and the person runs away. So he's like, 
what is this? It must mean something. So he then tries to find out. He goes on a search engine to find out perhaps what this is. Before the day is over, he's arrested. He's questioned. Um, and then when he comes back to work, he finds out that everybody thought he was taken out by paramedics. And he's like, so he's like, something's just not right here. Everybody else seems to get rebooted every day or something. He's, so he's, he's, he's under, trying to understand his world now because the world is not what he thought it was. And so he goes on this quest to find out what is this about. And wherever he seems to turn points him to this, these three letters. Uh, but it seems like there's a conspiracy around this that they don't want the world to know about. So that's where he goes deeper into this covert mystery uh, to find out what it means, because it must be important if people are trying to hide it. So are there some, uh, I guess, some action adventure in this? You said there's a bit of a love story. There is, um, um, is it futuristic? Uh, or is it, uh, you know, is it, does everything take place here on Earth? Well, uh, in the first book, everything is on Earth. If you hold to the third book, you'll get to go to Mars. Oh, nice. But uh, <laughs> so, but um, but, and uh, and you'll learn wh- why they have to go to Mars. So it, it's uh, it's and that's what he's also finding is that he's finding out that um, everything seems to be connected, and he's not sure why. It's like the Mars mission seems to be somewhat covert as well. Uh, so he doesn't understand why. He has to you know to understand all of that. Um, so, but, but, so it starts out with this mystery part uh, to find out what are these three letters and what do they mean. Then it turns into this adventure because when, to find out where it is, he has to go to Paris, to Hong Kong, uh, to these other places uh, to, uh, to, to find out. Um, and I have to say one of my favorite characters is Victoria, who's like this nin- ninja lady. Uh, that, that is in there. So there's some fun stuff in there, too, and uh, there's some banter back and forth between uh, Luke and his best friend. So. so the first book in the Coded Message Trilogy, THB, by Dr. Randy Dawkins, that's out now, right? Uh, the book will be out in September, uh, and the ebook is out now. So the ebook is out now. Um, as we're talking, this is July of 2017. Uh, so it's very likely, as we as we think about this, it's very likely out right now. So go out and get THB by Dr. Randy Dawkins. Uh, Randy, can we talk a little bit about your personal faith? Sure. How did you come to believe in Jesus Christ? Have you always been a Christian, or did you grow up a Christian? Well, I, I grew up in, in a Christian home, so I, I really do feel f- fortunate. And uh, m- maybe that sort of has shaped my view because I, be- I became a Christian before I became a scientist, because I became a Christian around the age of 12. Um, and, and so I, I never really doubted, uh, that God existed or who God was. Um, and I, I think when I began to hear different, uh, theories in science, I always, uh, felt like, well, there are some people that believe science is truth, but I believe science points to truth. Because our science is always evolving, you're always making new hypotheses, getting new data, so it's going to point you to the truth, but it's in, in, a, in and of itself, it can't be the truth. For instance, we used to believe the earth was flat, but then, of course, science proved that that was not true. So, so it, it's not that it destroys your belief in God. And I've heard some people say, oh, well, you know, as a creationist, you should believe that you're the center of, center of the universe. But it really isn't about us. It's about God. And personally, I'm glad that we're not in the center of our galaxy because I found out that the center of our, or we found out the center of our galaxy is a black hole, <laughs> which is not the best place to be, I don't think. So us being on the periphery of the galaxy is by design and a very good thing as we find out. So we find out that God is really knows what he's doing. When we, uh, the, more, the more we find out, the more we understand how, how he really does have the best for us in mind. So you're in a world that, as, as we know, and we've alluded to here, you play in a world that uh, is not faith friendly. So you've had, you, you must have had a lot of opposition to some of the, um, some of the beliefs that you, that you hold. Did you, through your life, Randy, have you ever had a time where you doubted your faith or maybe even the existence of God? Well, I, I never... I don't think I ever doubted his existence. I think I've, um, I, I went through, especially in my, I guess, teenage years and some of our college years, uh, d- doubting, um, 
how significant he was in, in my life. And I went through a, a period of, of doubt whether uh, I was, you know, really saved or not. In, in, in the sense, <clears throat> I felt like you had to be sort of perfect. As I, I, I guess I was somewhat of a perfectionist and, and, and thought I had to be perfect for God to accept me uh, until I really understood I was probably in graduate school before I really, really understood that God loved me for who I am, not for how I was or what I did. And, um, and that was a turning point f- for me to understand the real love that God has for us. How did you pull yourself from that perfectionism uh, to understanding that I am saved, uh, I am going to heaven, I will have an, an eternal relationship with God. I think it was when it really dawned on me that it was nothing that I did. I could never be good enough. No matter how perfect I thought I was, God's, you know, God's expects and demands perfection, which we can never achieve. So therefore, I didn't have to try to be good or try to be better or try to be perfect. All I had to do was accept what Christ had already done for me because it's through Christ's perfection that I am accepted, not through my own. And that was my turning point. That's one of those transactions that as a, uh, as a former unbeliever and as a believer that I still don't understand, Randy. And somehow in God's economy, he couldn't just snap his fingers and make it all good. He couldn't just snap his fingers and make us perfect. Uh, somehow in God's economy, he had to, perfection had to pay the punishment for imperfection. I don't understand why or how or how that transaction takes place. I don't think we have to necessarily understand it. But how do you feel about that? Well, I've been asked that before, and to me, if I understood God, he wouldn't be God. And so I don't want a God that I can understand. I want a God that I can depend on. And um, I think having a God that I cannot understand makes him more valid to me than trying to understand who he is. I understand his heart, and I think that's more critical. I don't want a God I understand. I want a God I can depend on. And God is faithful. Absolutely. Finally, as we wrap up, Randy, what would you say to that person that is right on faith's edge? Maybe they're in the scientific community right now. Maybe they're wrestling with the idea that, that science and faith are exclusive of each other. What would you say to that person that is right on faith's edge, making that choice to believe or not to believe in God? Well, I think uh, one thing, as I said before, was that we need to understand that we really do have a worldview that, that is our internal filter that we have to deal with. And that we also, I think the other thing is that to understand that God is really in the details and that we really have to look at the details. We can't just look at it from a, you know, a thousand foot view. You have to look at it from a microscopic view, perhaps, uh, to, and to take all of the facts together and don't overlook any of them. And I think that if you do that, I think that will, at least in my view, would help it to be more self-evident. The book is THB from the Coded Message Trilogy by Dr. Randy C. Dawkins. Dr. Dawkins, Randy, thank you so much for hanging out with us today. Thanks for having me. God bless, brother. Thank you. THB, the first book of the Coded Message Trilogy by Dr. Randy Dawkins, is available on Amazon.com. If you want your own free copy of the book, you can do it in a couple different ways. You can sign up for show updates, uh, follow and leave a comment on the On Faith's Edge Facebook page, follow me and share a tweet on Twitter, or just send me an email at joe at onfaithsedge.com. That's joe at onfaithsedge.com. And from those, from those folks, I'll pull a random winner and announce it on next week's show. To buy THB, please consider using the Amazon link uh, at onfaithsedge.com. You'll see it right there. We'll get a small commission from Amazon, and it won't cost you a penny more. 
All these links are in this episode's show notes at onfaithsedge.com slash 86. That's onfaithsedge.com slash 86. Well, that will wrap up today's show. Thank you to Dr. Randy Dawkins for being with us. Thank you to Clay Lamb for sharing your faith story. And thank you for listening. You mean a lot to me and you mean a lot to this show. Remember, God is real. He does love you. And so do I. God bless. Thank you for listening to On Faith's Edge. You can subscribe to the show via iTunes, Stitcher, Internet Radio, or your favorite podcast app on Android, Apple, or Windows devices. To reach out to Joe or leave comments about the show, visit onfaithsedge.com. You're important to us, and we would love to hear from you. 